On this week's GCN Racing News Show, how does today Pogaccia compare to the sport's greats? With over 50 wins under his belt before the age of 25, the stats are incredibly interesting. I'll also be looking back at incredible saves and brilliant racing in Algarve, Andalusia, Valenciana, Oman, Glasgow and Tour des Alpes Maritime et Duvar, so we'd better get started. This week in the world of racing, we learnt that near misses were the theme of the week. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Tom Pitcock going cycle Go across on the time trial bike. Oh! Wow, Van Hemmelen there. Oh, just oh, well saving held. that. No. Oh. oh my goodness me. We also learnt, thanks to Rob Hatch, that we are all in the court of King Magnus. They could be on them behind, it could be heartbreak oh. for this big group of riders, and I think they've decided now, they've realised they will be caught, and with just 450 metres to the line, they have been caught. But Court is there, and can he go? He's going to launch his sprint to try and get something, to try and take advantage of any chaos behind. It's the race leader, it's Magnus Court trying to hold them off all on his own. Ganna tries to get involved as well. Ganna's there on the left hand side. Magnus Court still got a gap though. And look at Magnus Court go! Magnus Court is on another level and still going, still going. They'll try, they'll try, but they cannot. And Magnus Court with one of the victories of his career. We are all in the court of King Magnus. An absolutely sensational finale there to the third stage of the Walter Algarve. Magnus Court and EF are on fire. More on that later on. We also learned that it's now just five days until our first cobblestones of 2023. Omloop Het Newsbad comes on Saturday. If you are not already subscribed to GCM Plus, make sure you do so before then. Some territory restrictions do apply to Omloop, but for Kuna Brussels Kuna on Sunday, there are no restrictions at all, so I look forward to having your company then. Finally, we learnt that we are living in the Tade Pugaccia era. He started his 2023 season this time last week at the high-end Paraiso Interior and has since racked up five wins. Five wins! That is absolutely bonkers. He's going to turn 25 this September, but his career tally of wins is already up to 51. He's the current pro with the most wins since the start of 2019, which is when he turned pro. Uh, his 51 wins put him eight ahead of Primoz Roglic, who sits second. Avonapool is third with 37 wins, although he didn't turn pro until 2020. Whilst the sprinter with the most wins over that time is Arno Demar with 35. Although I'm sure other sprinters would point out that he picks up a lot of those wins in smaller stage races. So how does Pogaccia compare to the other greats, past and present? Well, we've picked out a few key names and we're going to start with a sprinter, Marcel Kittel. Now, he didn't turn pro until 2011, by which point he was already 22. Standard for that era, but it does put him at a disadvantage when making comparisons at an early age. He'd won five pro races by his 23rd birthday and 37 by his 25th birthday. That is 14 short of Pogaccia, who is still seven months away from turning 25. Mark Cavendish was also a relatively slow starter. He'd won half as many races by his 22nd birthday as Pogaccia had by his 21st, but once he'd started winning, things really did accelerate. He reached the milestone of 50 pro race wins by the age of 24 years and 93 days, 67 days younger than Pogaccia was when he reached that same milestone last Friday. Now the current rider who trumps them all though on that front is Peter Sagan. He'd racked up 50 wins just five months after his 23rd birthday. By the time he was 24, he had 58 wins under his belt versus Pogaccia's 44. It's easy to forget just how young Sagan was when he was already a prolific winner. But the ultimate comparison is always, and will always be, Eddie Merckx, the cannibal. Merck started actually a little slower than Pogaccia. By his 21st birthday, he'd racked up five wins compared with Pogaccia's eight. But by the age of 22, he was already leaps ahead with 27 wins versus Pogaccia's 17. From there on, the gap only increases. 45 wins to Pogaccia's 29 by the age of 23, 70 to Pogaccia's 44 by the age of 24. Now, for Pogaccia to get on terms with Merck by the same age, he'd need to win another 46 races between now and September the 21st this year. 
And given that he probably won't even race that many days between now and then, that's going to be a little difficult. Now, the current rider who is tracking closest to Merckx is fellow Belgian Remco Evenepoel. Of the riders we've discussed, Evenepoel is the only rider who turned pro straight out of the junior category, and he started winning immediately. By the age of 21, he was streaked ahead of all these greats with 14 wins. Uh, the win rate slowed due to that crash in Lombardy in 2020, but even with that, he'd already amassed 37 wins by his 23rd birthday just under a month ago. That is more than either Pogaccia or Sagan, more than Cavendish and Kittel combined. That said, it still leaves him eight wins shy of Merckx at the very same age. However, we live in a very different era now one in which professional cycling is a much more level playing field, and one where there are a lot more riders more than capable of winning the biggest races in the world. The difference between the best and the rest is decreasing, and so that is what makes Evenepoel and Pogaccia's stats all the more impressive. Now, another impressive thing about Pogaccia is the way that he starts every season, seemingly. He's now won his first race of every season since 2020 the World de Valenciana that year, the UAE Tour in 21 and 22, and now the Classica Jaén Paraiso Interior this year. He also, of course, won his last race of 2022, Il Lombardia. He likes to finish first, doesn't he, that lad? Now, as things stand, over his last 13 days of competition, he has won eight races. The question is, though, is he doing too much too soon? We are, after all, only in February, which means his big goal of the season, the Tour de France, is still five months away. His arch rival, meanwhile, Jonas Vingegaard, hasn't done a single day of racing so far in 2023, and Jumbo Visma as a whole are having a much slower start to the season. A deliberately much slower start to the season, you would imagine. That paid off for them last year, of course, but only time will tell which methodology pays off this coming July. What do you think at home? Is Pogaccia using too much energy too early in the season? And what do you think about him winning so much? Do you find it boring to always see the same name at the top or exciting because of the way he wins those races? Let me know in the comment section just down below. Let's move on to some actual racing now and I'm going to start with the Volta Algarve. Stage one couldn't have gone any better for Uno X there. Neo Pro Suren Varnschgold provided the final lead out, ultimately finishing third himself on the stage, whilst his teammate Alexander Kristoff finished the job off to take his 87th career victory. Tom Pidcock, who initially finished fifth that day, was later relegated for this push on the run into the finish line. It was a bad day for Mark Hirschi of UAE Team Emirates as well. He was involved in a crash and fractured his right radius bone and is expected to be out of competition for eight weeks at least. Stage two was the first for the GC riders to show themselves, although the Alta de Foya is increasingly becoming a small group sprint stage as opposed to a climb that decimates the field. This year, close to 30 rides were still in the mix as they approached the finish line, a line that was ultimately crossed by Ilan van Wilder with his hands in the air. Unfortunately for him, though, it wasn't the first win of his career because Magnus Court had snuck past him. You live and learn. Uh, hopefully, it won't be too long before we see Van Wilder with his arms in the air again, as well as crossing the line first at the same time. Now, you already saw the finish to stage three at the top of the show, but my word, that was one of the best races I've seen in quite some time. Up until the final intermediate sprint, it was all looking to be quite a normal day. The early breakaway was reeled in with around 30 kilometers to go. And for all intents and purposes, this was going to be the second opportunity for the sprinters. But at that intermediate sprint, everything changed. Magnus Court took the three bonus seconds with some ease there, but the other five riders that had been vying for it found themselves with a decent gap over the bunch behind. A bunch who had assumed that those front guys would sit up after the bonus seconds were decided, as is normally the case. Only this time, they looked around, then looked at each other, and decided to just go for it. By the time the sprinters team behind realized what was happening, they already had a decent gap. Now with former and current world time trial champions Ganna and Foss there, along with former world road champion Costa, as well as Pidcock and Court, it was not going to be an easy chase. Sudan Quickstep, along with the help of Uno X, pretty much did catch them before the finish, but they'd burnt so many riders in doing so, they didn't have any energy left for the final. However, we should take nothing away from Magnus Court. That was a sensational win. Impressive sprint too by Ganna to take second place on the stage, and with a TT still to come, he was looking threatening for the general classification. 
Now, he did lose some time on stage four, though, which was the second summit finish of the race. That was won in impressive style by Tom Pidcock. Believe it or not, that was just his third win as a pro. Uh, that win also put him into the leader's jersey going into that final TT. But with the top 10 separated by just 32 seconds, there was a lot still to play for. Pidcock's TT wasn't good enough to defend that lead, although it certainly wasn't for the want of trying and pushing the limits. But for Ineos, it didn't really matter. Danny Martinez pulled out one of the best TTs of his career, and it was enough to take the overall classification just two seconds in front of his teammate Ganna. Uh, he becomes the first ever Colombian to win the Volta Algarve. One of the most impressive efforts that day, though, came from Van Wilder, who finished seventh on the stage, and that was enough to finish third on GC. Winner of the stage, though, Stefan Kung. Fantastic to see him take that win there, especially in front of the likes of Cavagnar, Ganna, and Foss. Moving on, and I'm not sure there's a huge amount to wrap up at the Vuelta Andalusia. It really was the Pogaccia and UAE show. He put in one attack on stage one and was never seen again. He backed that up with another win the following day before allowing teammate Tim Wellens up the road on stage three to take his customary win at Alcala de los Casules. That's the third time that he's won there. Pogaccio was back to winning ways on stage four, putting the GC firmly out of the picture for anyone else, and then was on lead-out duties for Alessandro Covey on the final stage. I can't help but think that Pogaccio's lead-outs are a little bit like Van der Poel's and Avonapool's, though. They are so fast, they pretty much put their teammates over the limit. Covey did manage to take second on the stage, having been overtaken by Omar Freili, who took his first ever win in the colours of Ineos Grenadiers. One other point of note is that the all-new Enric Mas that we saw at last year's Vuelta España is still here in 2023. He had a mechanical on stage one that took him out of the podium picture, but after that, he was attacking climb, descents, and pretty much everything in between. Love to see it. Meanwhile, at the UCI Cycling Esports World Championships on Saturday, we had a thrilling finale to both races. Thanks, incidentally, to all of you who tuned in to our live show on Saturday evening. I thought the brand new format was a great success, personally, and it seems that most of you did too. Three short, sharp races each for the men and women meant there was almost constant action from the start to finish. In the men's, relative unknown Bjorn Andreasen of Denmark attacked from the start of the final race, and with everyone behind reluctant to spend their energy chasing him, he managed to time trial his way to victory. Andreasen is a mountain biker, 21 years of age, and now a UCI world champion, so well done to him. In the women's, in-form Lewis Adekest always looked to be in supreme control, and ultimately she comfortably won the sprint to retain her title in the women's event. She really is a class act. As is Zoe Langham, in fact, who finished second despite holding down a full-time job as a doctor. Here's what she had to say after picking up that silver medal. My grand's just messaged me saying, quit your day job. <laughs> <laughs> always listen to your grand. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Always listen to your elders. Uh, yeah, yeah, abs absolutely. Uh, there you go, Gran. She'll be li she's listening. She's watching the, uh, the GCN. Um, but yeah, it, yeah, we'll, we'll see. Um, I'm trying to make both things work at the moment, but you never know. Um, I absolutely love cycling, and whenever anyone asks me what I do, I always say cycling, and being a doctor just doesn't come into it. <laughs> um, so we'll see, yeah. Great stuff. Right, I'll move on now to the Tour des Alpes Maritimes et du Var, a French race dominated by French riders this year. Kevin Vacalin of Arkea Samsic took his maiden pro win after a late attack on stage one. Uh, he was the rider with the most top tens last year who didn't take a victory, but he's now got two because he also ended up winning the general classification. Matthias Schelmoser took the only non-French win of the three days on stage two, outsprinting Nielsen Paulus there, whilst the third and final stage was won by Aurelien Paripanta of AG2R. One of the more controversial moments of the race, though, was this. The Total Energy's team car giving Burgodeau a sticky bottle at the front of the race that allowed him to ride away from Uno X's and Ne Volta. Uh, that move, quite rightly, got a lot of criticism on social media, but the UCI fine and punishment after the stage was pretty lenient, really, and certainly not harsh enough to prevent moves like this continuing to happen. Uh, moving on, and unfortunately we didn't have the rights to show the women's Volta Valenciana, which was a great shame because it was a cracking race. Trek Segafredo's Elisa Balsamo dominated the first two stages, winning both of them in sprints. Second on both of those stages were Lotta Hentala of AG Insurance. 
Now, Hintala had pretty much retired from the sport at the end of 2021, having given birth to her first child. She said she didn't really have any thought of making a comeback last year, but I'm sure that she's very pleased she did, as are we. Incredibly impressive results in her first race back with the pros. She is this week's GCN Racing Rider of the Week. And it turned out to be a very successful race for that team as well. Ashley Milman Pascio out sprinted Annemiek van Flurzen and Amanda Spratt on the Queen stage of the race. And then on the fourth and final stage, Justine Gecquier got away with Elise Oyen, and the latter took in the stage and the former taking the overall victory by a single second from her teammate Milman Pascio. Over in Oman, Mary van Sevenant's victory on the final day of the race marked the 900th for Sudal Quickstep as a team. He pipped Matteo Jorgensen of Movistar on that summit finish, but the American took the overall win by a single second. That and his stage win earlier in the week were his first two victories as a pro rider. On to what we've got coming up for you on GCN Plus this week, and guess what? There's a lot for you. This coming Saturday and Sunday, it's opening weekend, our very first taste of the Belgian cobbles, and I honestly cannot wait. On Saturday, we have the men's Homloop Het Newsbad first, followed straight after by the women's. That race will also mark the return of the breakaway, our pre and post race show for the biggest races of the season, where we'll preview and analyze both races. Last year's male winner, Wout van Aert, is not on the start line this year. He'll start one week later at Strade Bianche, but we've still got a great list of riders in attendance. On the women's side, Van Fleurten will be back to defend her title. Louis Adakeist is also there, along with Zoe Bagstedt, Vives, Longo Borghini, Volering, Kopecky, Balsalma, and many, many others. Then on Sunday, many of the men's competitors will again be seen racing at Kuna Brussels Kuna. There will be more cobbles on the menu there, but it's slightly less arduous than Omelette Het Newsblad, so there will be a few more sprinters on the start line. Ahead of the weekend, though, the UAE Tour will continue through to Sunday. As I record this, they are midway through stage one, and it is Echelon City. Avenapool right up there, but the big news as I saw it was that UAE Team Emirates didn't have a single rider in the first Echelon. We will, of course, have live coverage each day of that. A lot of pressure going into it for UAE's Adam Yates, though. It's his first race with the team, who've won the last two editions with Pogaccia. They won't want to lose on their home race, but it wasn't looking too good on stage one. Highlights of the Tour de Rwanda will continue through to Sunday as well. That race kicked off yesterday with a sprint win for Ethan Vernon, racing there for the Sudal Quickstep development team. And then starting on Thursday, it's the four-day Gran Camino, formerly known as the Vuelta Galicia, and it's where we'll see Tour de France champion Jonas Vinigor making his 2023 competitive debut. Beyond all of that, we have two one-day races in France this weekend, the Fawn Ardèche and Fawn Drome Classic, both very tough races in their own right. Now, since it's going to be nigh on impossible to watch everything live, a reminder that you will be able to watch those races on demand where and when you wish. Territory restrictions do apply to some of the races that I've just mentioned though, so please, as ever, check what is available to watch where you are. And don't forget that the new season of the World of Cycling has now begun. You can watch episode two on GCN Plus this coming Wednesday. Uh, just before we finish, I thought we should take a look at the current win standings amongst the men's World Tour teams. Off the top of the standings are Antomarche Circus Wanty, and replacing them are EF Education Easy Post. They've got 10 wins already this year, which is more than they got in the whole of 2022. I don't know what they've changed there, but something is clearly working. Right, that is all for this week, folks. Hope you're enjoying all the racing so far, but rest assured, things are going to really go up a notch this weekend. I will see you then. Goodbye for now.